not really be here, but uh, um, be virtually here in Vancouver, back in Vancouver, like it was uh, a bit over a year ago. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about some problem that I was really, really obsessed with for a year and a half now. Um, so I hope I can convince you uh, why, why this thing is interesting. So before I start telling you about the details and anything, um, let me start with a few warnings. So first one is, I tend to talk a bit fast or everything, so um, feel free to interrupt any time if you have questions or I spoke too fast and you want me to just slow down or repeat what I just said, that's absolutely fine. I much prefer you interrupt me on the floor rather than telling me at the end you got nothing out of the talk because um, of the way I was speaking. Um, but yeah, welcome everyone to this talk. So I want to tell you about edge scoring. So that was in the title, so it's not a big surprise. Um, so you have a graph, just a simple uh, loopless graph. And you're trying to color the edges in such a, such a way that uh, two edges which are incident, meaning the shared endpoint, have to receive different colors. So it's really like coring the vertices of the graph, except while well, you're coring the edges. So if you're familiar, familiar with what the line graph of a graph is, then that's exactly a normal vertex coring of the line graph of a graph. But yeah, so it's really, we just call it edge coring. And just like normal coring, well, it's not very hard to color. The hard thing is to use few colors for it. So you're trying to minimize the number of colors uh, you use to color the, the edges of the graph. And you call this the chromatic index sky prime. Um, so here in this example, we can see here I have a proper coring with three colors. And you can see there are no two infinite edges with the same color. That's not hard to check. And you can convince yourself pretty easily that there's no way you can do this with two. So you know for C5, chromatic index is uh, is three. But that's not a very interesting sub subcase. I mean, C5 is a pretty interesting graph, but maybe not here. Um, so what happens in general? How, how can we have an idea in general of how many number of colors uh, we need? So one obvious parameter that's really linked to uh, edge chromatic index and to chromatic index sorry, is the maximum view of the graph. So if you have vertex with a lot of different neighbors, then of course you need a different color for each of the instant edges. So that's a trivial lower bound uh, for the number of colors you're going to need to color the edges. That's, there's no way avoiding that. So that's a trivial lower bound. And the thing which is really, really nice uh, with edge coring, as opposed to what happens for vertex coring or similar uh, questions, is that actually the trivial, well, it's not really trivial. <laughs> I should not say it's trivial. Uh, but the, um, there's an upper bound holding for every single graph uh, which is really close to the trivial lower bound. Um, so that's a theorem by Wiesing in 1964. Actually, that's in this paper that he invented when he defined uh, edge coring to begin with, saying that, so we have this trivial lower bound of um, maximum degree of vertices, maximum degree of vertex in the graph. And what he proved, which is super uh, interesting, is that you never, never need more than one more color than the trivial lower bound. So what this says is, I mean, you don't know if your graph needs uh, delta plus one colors or delta colors are enough, but you know, it's one of the two options. I mean, yeah, that, that's quite nice. I mean, the chromatic index can only be one out of two options uh, for a given graph. Even if you, you know, don't know more about the graph than just maximum degree, you already know you only have two options um, for the number of colors to use. So how does he prove this? Because I said, you know, I corrected myself and she said it was a trivial one and I say, I should not say it's trivial. The proof is not trivial. I mean, it's not very hard, but it's quite smart. So how does he do it? Actually, he does it through something called Kempe changes. So I think in Vancouver, lots of you are familiar uh, with notion of Kempe changes, if only just because uh, Boyan has worked on it quite a, quite a bit. But let me still define it for you. So what's a Kempe change? So you have um, a graph, still C5, because that's the best graph ever. And you have a proper scoring of it. And when you do Kempe change, you select two colors. Say here I select colors uh, blue and red. So I look at the graph induced in my graph by the edges colored blue or red, and then I swap the colors in one component. So here I only have one component being colored green red, so it's not, uh, there's not much of a uh, suspense, but still, so I can flip them. So I would, I would get this coring, uh, which you can see on the left. So that, that's, that was one complete, complete change uh, from the first coring to the second. So there are other options. Instead of picking blue and red, you could pick, for example, 
um, green and red. So then it's a bit more interesting than the than blue and red because you have two components. So you can choose which one to, to swap. So I mean, the graph you obtain when you look only at the red and the green edges is just one edge alone away from the rest or this pattern two edges um, separately from it. And now if you swap uh, the bottom case, I mean, if, if you took the pattern two edges, then you get this coloring. And if you swap, if you made the other choice, meaning you swap just the edge, then you get this coloring. And you can see, you know, that you can convince yourself pretty easily that by doing this, you're going to generate all uh, three edge scorings of C5. And actually, what Vizing proved, I mean, the way he obtained his theorem is by saying something a bit surprising, which is that you give me a proper edge scoring, it doesn't matter how many colors it, it uses, it just has to be proper. So you could use, you know, a number of edges colors. And the only thing is, as long as there is one color involved in the graph, um, which is beyond the type plus one, so color, you know, at least the type plus two, then what I can do is through a series of complete changes, in a way, uh, make sure there's some color between one and the type plus one, which does not appear on any of the instant edges. So then I can do a trivial complete change on just one edge. So I can recolor from this color, which is more than the plus one, something which is below the plus one. So this way, really, so give me a proper edge coloring, which uses, you know, it's really not efficient. Like it uses arbitrary many colors. And at each step, I can look at the graph and without introducing any new color, I can in a way decrease the number of uh, edges using the max color in some sense. So as long as I have, you know, a bit more than the optimal number of colors, then I can keep doing this. And then eventually I have no more edge colored delta plus two or more. So I have uh, delta plus one edge coloring. I'll go back later to exactly how you do this, but this is roughly what's going on. So this is how um, he proves this, this, uh, this theorem. And the thing which was, uh, which I did not know for, uh, for very long, I mean, for a long time I didn't know this, I only learned about this a year and a half ago, as I said, is that in this same paper, where he proves this, actually he asks a very natural question, uh, which is, okay, this tells you you can always reach the delta plus one edge uh, scoring of your graph, but what if your graph actually doesn't need the delta plus one colors? What if your graph is delta, delta edge scorable? Can you, can you then reach uh, a delta edge scoring? So that's actually a conjecture of his. Uh, actually, he, he only stated it uh, the year after, so saying, Give me any graph, give me any proper scoring. So again, same setting. Uh, is it true that, well, I can always reach uh, an optimal edge scoring? So either the type one, I mean, I know I can do this if my graph needs the type one colors, but can I for sure reach a delta edge scoring of my graph if my graph can be colored with uh, delta colors? I mean, of course, if you can't be colored, it's a good reason not to find one. But uh, this connection is really saying that you can get more in some sense. And again, just through complete changes, you know, not involving any color, not around uh, before and uh, with no other operation and just, you know, this simple looking at the colors, looking at the graph and just by that, taking a component, switching the colors there. So before I tell you what's known around this connection and what, what I want to tell you uh, about this connection, let me tell you briefly about the algorithmic uh, side of things. So actually when you look at the proof of um, this initial Vizing theorem, and I still haven't told you exactly how the proof works, but uh, bear with me on that. Actually what you can prove is that not only there is a delta plus one edge coring, I mean a proper, I mean every, all corings here are proper, so I, should, I can stop saying it maybe. Um, not only there is a delta plus one edge coring, but you can actually find one pretty, pretty efficiently. So efficiently is just, you know, number of systems, number of edges. So it's not just polynomial, it's even like a really small polynomial. So you're really happy with that. And, and it's really not hard uh, from the proof to, to observe that the, the, such an algorithm can be found. So now when you look at the connection, you can start and hope, you know, that if this is true, then maybe similarly you can get a nice pass algorithm to, to obtain, you know, uh, delta edge scoring if, um, if the graph is delta edge scorable and obtain such a, such a coin pretty fast. The bad news is uh, it's actually be hard to decide whether you, whether delta colors can be enough or not for your graph. So that's already a bad news for this, uh, for this conjecture. I mean, you know that in the version where you allowed one more color, I mean, you, you, when you're for sure only going to aim for delta plus one colors, 
you know, there's a really simple, nice, fast algorithm uh, that you obtain one. And the second one, I mean, in the second setting, well, you know that it's pretty unlikely you're going to find a polynomial algorithm. I mean, if you, if you do find one, then sure, you're going to be happy, but you're going to be happy for a much bigger reason than just the fact that you found the um, delta h prime pretty fast. OK, so that's the setting for this ledger. Um, let me tell you a bit about what's known um, around this ledger. So you still have no questions so far? I mean, I hope I made it very clear that uh, you should feel free to interrupt if you have any question or anything. So, Marta, you. Marta, it, it, Marta, it's Jonathan here. I actually do have a question. There's something that you're saying, and I'm, I'm really sorry, but I'm not quite catching it. It sounds a little bit like tapas plus one or tapas plus two Ooh, or delta. four. Delta plus saying, one. Delta, just delta plus one. Yeah, I think that's what so, I say. I keep saying it. Um, so I say either delta plus one or delta of g plus one. I mean, I often drop the parameter because I'm only ever talking about delta of the graph. So, but yeah, I, I assume what I'm repeating, which sounds like this, is uh, delta plus one. So exactly um, the number of colors you get from the Zinc's theorem. Got it. Thank you. That, does that answer your question? Does that make sense? Yes. Thank Excellent. you. But yeah, thanks for mentioning, the, mentioning this because I often just drop the G because you know I always talk about the stem graph. Actually, I realize even on this slide, it's not quite consistent as to when the parameter is here and when not. It's just you know, to make sure the audience has to pay attention. Um, yeah, okay, so let me tell you about the um, state of the art um, around this nature. So one first thing, I mean, before I tell you, you know, subcases, anything, let me tell you how it relates to other things. So I just remove the same nature, like they, you, there's nothing new in this, uh, in this statement. So three says, for new perpetual scoring, there is an optimal edge scoring you can find uh, just through a series of computer changes. And as, uh, as I said, I mean, because, because of the Zing's theorem, you know that if your graph actually needs that plus one colors, then it's, it's true. I mean, that's been known for a long time. So it's only interesting if your graph uh, can be detached colored. And one thing which is really, really nice, in my opinion, is a conjecture by Boyan uh, quite recently, 15 years, a bit less than 15 years ago now, um, saying that you know, in this conjecture by Wiesing, is, is that there is uh, a proper scoring you can, you can find, but you don't, you don't really get to choose it. So his conjecture is that actually, if you allow one more color, so if you have, instead of aiming for a delta plus one uh, edge scoring, you're going to say you, you have delta plus two colors involved. And the connection is that having this just small one extra color, then you can go from any coring to any other through a series of competitive changes. So really to highlight, I mean, Bising's theorem says that um, there is a proper delta plus one edge coring you can reach, but you don't get to choose it. And the point of is that if you have one more color involved, then you can choose any two colors you, you like, any two delta plus two edge corings you like, and you can go from one to the other through uh, generally. So when I say two corings are complement, I mean you can go from one to the other through this series of um, elementary operations which are complete changes. Um, so his conjecture is only interesting when uh, your chromatic number, I mean, when your graph needs delta plus one colors, because what's, what's proved is that um, if you have a delta scoring, then as soon as you have two more colors involved, then you can do everything. It's not trivial, apart from trivial, uh, but it's not, it's not so complicated. I mean, once you have the right way of thinking about it, then you can see that um, two extra colors makes everything work. It's only hard when you have only one extra color. And then it's super hard, but you know. Um, so you have these two connections. And they are, you know, somewhat related in spirit, but in one is uh, you don't get to choose the optimal scoring, and in the second you get to choose it, but you have more colors uh, involved. And they are both only interesting in one of the two cases, but a different one. The one thing which is kind of funny is that she, visiting signature, if true, would imply buoyance conjecture. Uh, just, I mean, if, I'm pretty sure you could figure out the proof if you tried, uh, just by induction, the maximum degree of the graph, maximum, by induction delta. Because when, when delta is zero, that's true. And then you can just uh, work from it, work from there. Um, yeah, so Boyan's conjecture seems simpler. But one thing which I found funny 
is that she, all the ways we know of finding special cases of buoyant signature where things work are through visiting signature. So there, there's been some work on small delta, and each time it's uh, proving something for visiting signature. So you prove, you know, so there was this theorem by Idol, Mohar, and Scheider uh, 10 years ago saying that visiting signature is true for delta being three. So in other words, when you have a graph with maximum max three, so a cubic subcubic graph, if you give me any proper scoring to begin with, then I can end the graph is uh, three scorable, which is uh, non non, which is an important hypothesis. Then I can, through a series of competencies, for sure go to a three edge scoring of the graph. So it's only interesting when I start from a four edge scoring, but I give me any fresh scoring of a subcubic graph, for sure through a series of competencies I can get down to a three edge scoring, which is really interesting. Um, but again, it doesn't say you can choose it, but this implies um, by the previous statement that all five edge scorings of a subcubic graph are equivalent. So it implies uh, point signature for max degree four. So there's a small difference between the uh, between the max degrees, but um, yeah. And a year, uh, not a year later, six years later, there was some more progress um, about this signature again. So proving it for delta being four. Was a Stratian and Cassegrain. Um, so again, I mean, same statement. It's just it's of looking at speed graph. You can allow uh, that's of degree four, and you have one more color uh, involved. But that's so to give you an idea. Like uh, this proof is actually really technical. Uh, it's really interesting. I mean, there are lots of very nice ideas in the proof. Um, but you can see that it's a lot more work each time. So maybe you're expecting me now to say, well, now and delta like equals to five uh, it works. I'm actually not going to say that. Uh, what we proved, which I'm uh, excited to share, is that without any assumption on max degree, so really we're not really looking at max degree five or six or anything, we're just assuming there is no triangle on the graph. So give me a triangle two graph, regardless of what the max degree is, for sure, um, given a proper scoring of it, I can get down to an optimal scoring. So, I mean, you can, if, if your graph needs delta plus one colors, then it was already using theorem, but if your graph can be delta H colored, then for sure um, we can reach one through a series of competencies, no matter which proper coring we start with. But should we put something a little bit stronger, which so it also implies uh, buoyant signature, but in a strong form, which is that for any triangle of your graph, when I look at all edge corings in the same, um, with some number of colors, as long as the color is at least one more than the optimal number, then for sure they're all equivalent, all copy equivalent. So it's kind of something in between visiting signature and buoyant signature. It's really saying, so we know we can always reach an optimal edge scoring, but also as, as soon as you have one more color than the optimal, then everything is uh, completely equivalent. So when we really prove this, um, give me any proper edge scoring of the graph. Well, either it's already an optimal edge scoring, I do nothing or it's not an optimal scoring, but then I can choose which optimal scoring to go to. So I have a choice. That's, that's in a way the main, the main statement. So it's not true in general that if you start from an optimal scoring, you can go to any other optimal scoring. I mean, it's, we, we know we need this extra um, freedom of first one, but it could be true that this is, uh, this is correct for all graphs. So actually, as I said, I have been obsessed with this question for a year and a half now. I would really, really like to say that we can get rid of the triangle free uh, assumption here. Actually, and up until this very afternoon, I was uh, going through proof, trying to see how to get rid of some technicalities in the, in the argument. So we're quite confident we can push it. Um, we're quite confident we can replace triangle free with diamond free. It's still not very satisfying. I mean, so diamond is just um, two triangles sharing an edge. So it's better than just saying you know, that if there's no triangle, you're happy. You're providing something a lot more uh, construct, uh, constricting than triangles. But uh, of course, the big frustration is uh, not being able yet to, to get rid entirely of, the, of this restriction. I'll go back to this uh, later. So this is with um, essentially the whole state of the art around this signature. I mean, there's, there's, there has been some results about you know, if the max degree vertices in the use of forest and things like this, then 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 you're happy. But um, essentially, for me now, the goal would be to try and have some 
weak assumption, say, on the structure of the whole graph. So let me, let me tell you a bit about how we prove this. Um, if you need motivation to try and listen to the proof, this also implies how to prove using theorem. So, you know, that's at least one <laughs> reason to, to pay attention to the arguments. So the arguments are actually pretty, pretty simple. So you want to do it again by induction. So you're going to do it by induction on the chromatic index, so the number of colors you need to color the edges of your graph. And actually, for simplicity, and just because, yeah, it makes things simple, simpler, you're going to restrict yourself to uh, regular graphs. So if you have k colors involved, you're going to assume you're only looking at uh, k regular graphs. So it's actually really cheap to assume. Because as long as it's not the case, I mean, as soon as your graph, so it is kh correlable, but it, it has vertices of degree less than k. So as long as this is the case, you take two copies and you have the matching between the um, vertices of minimum degree. I mean, for a given vertex of uh, degree less than k, you add an edge between its copy on one side and its copy on the other side. And this does not uh, increase the number of colors you need because you also mirror the colors on coloring, some, the coloring, sorry, on both sides. And then for sure, because it's the same coloring on both sides, there's always the color available because your vertex has degree less than K. So you do not use all K colors around, so there's one available. And this way, really for, for free, um, if you have K colors involved, you can assume your graph is K regular. So that makes things a lot simpler, just because then it's easier to think about what the graph looks like. But it's really between induction on the number of colors, not on the structure of the graph or the number of vertices or stuff. So when you do this operation of taking copies and stuff, the number of vertices blows up uh, quite badly, but we don't mind. Um, so you have a regular graph. And now this, this is where uh, you see that there is no trouble with the fact that it's NP-hard to decide whether the graph is um, delta edge correlable or not. Actually, now this is where you're cheating. This is where you're having a really non-algorithmic proof. You say, okay, let me have a sneak peek at, the, at an optimal edge coloring I want, to, I want to reach. So I'm, I'm assuming I have a delta edge coloring, which is, you know, in most algorithmic senses is cheating. And you look at the color class. I mean, so you look at, you pick a color, say color one, and you look at all the edges in the graph which are colored one. And the thing which is nice now, is because you assume your graph to be regular, I mean, because you rightfully assume your graph to be regular, um, the color class, I mean, the edges you're looking, the edges which are colored one form a perfect matching. So you know that touch every vertex in the, in the graph and, and they all should have the same color. So the three, so you have this target perfect matching, so it's called M. So you have, to, you have this perfect matching, which you really want to color always the same color, so say color one. So that's really what you want, want to do. And once you do it, you're going to be happy because the fact that it's a perfect matching means that once it's all colored with the same color, that color does not appear anywhere else in the graph. So you can delete all these edges, and then you have you know, one fewer color involved in the graph, and you can keep going. I mean, as I said, you're doing by induction, by induction on the number of um, colors involved. In, in your coloring, so that's perfectly fair. So really, because it's perfect matching, you make it, make it more chromatic, then you can delete everything, apply induction. So it's all, you know, that's a good goal. Okay, sure, let's make this perfect matching monochromatic. How do we do this? How, how do you make sure the whole, this whole perfect matching is going to be uh, all the same color? So you have this helpful notion of um, good, bad, and ugly edges. So what's a good edge? It's an edge which should be colored one. I mean, it's, it is in, uh, in the perfect matching. I mean, it is actually colored one, so everything is fine. I mean, if every edge in M is good, then you can just apply induction. So what's a bad edge? Well, a bad edge is it's, a, it's an edge which should be colored one, but it's not. So you want to call it one, but you have to work for it. And ugly is something which is not in M, but like it's called one when it shouldn't be. Because like, I mean, it, it, it's basically getting in the way of putting the color one on some of the edges you want color one. So that's why it's ugly. It's kind of not such a big deal in itself, but you know, it's going to be annoying uh, further down the proof in some sense. Like if you can get rid of them, you're happy. So you're going to try, so you have, you started from this arbitrary uh, edge coring using one more color than the optimal. And you, you're trying to get closer and closer to something being monochromatic. 
So you're trying to minimize the bad edges, and then with respect to that, trying to minimize the ugly edges, and you're trying to prove you know, that you can always um, win on one on one side. Marta, Marta, yes. I'm I'm sorry to interrupt again. Um, no, no, it's no Jonathan. Really sorry. I've got a question. I don't understand what you mean when you say M is one of the color classes. To me, that means oh. that everything in M has color one. So I, I don't quite get what you're doing there. Sorry. Yeah. Let me let me say it again. Thank, thanks. Thanks a lot for asking the question. That, that's uh, helpful. You you're right that I wasn't very clear. So you start from a chi prime plus one edge coring. So you have this non-optimal edge coring there, and you have this target optimal edge coring. So you, you have to imagine that currently you have a core and using one more color than it should. So it's basically a, you know, a messy edge coring. It's not behaving like it should. And you're thinking about what you want to obtain in the graph. This is, you're thinking about what you want eventually to, to have. And eventually you have this target uh, edge coring, which you want to reach. And as a first step towards reaching that, you, you select one color class in that target. So you're thinking about your dream coring. You pick one color, color one, say, and you look at all the edges which should be color one, and you say, okay, I'm going to first try and do this. I'm going to try and you know make my current coring closer to the target coring. And then once I manage to do that, then I can delete and start again. But you already should be clear about the fact you start from this non-optimal edge coring and you have this target dream optimal edge coring. And you're just trying to get closer to it one touch matching at a time. Thank you. So yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Great. But yeah, thanks, thanks for asking. Uh, you're right that I was not uh, perfectly clear on what was the picture here. Um, yeah, so you have those good edges, which, are already, you, which you're already happy with. You have these bad edges, which should be color one and are not. And you have these ugly edges, which are colored one and are getting in the way of edges, which should actually be colored one. So how, how do you get rid of some bad or ugly edges? How, how do you improve the quality of your coring? How do you get closer uh, to this target coring you're dreaming of? So there's a tool which already appears in Vizings, Vizings uh, initial proof of 1964. So this is why I said uh, it's still uh, worth paying attention to this if you don't know um, of the standard Vizings proof yet. So you have an edge in your graph and say it's color two, but say you're actually not happy with the color two. You want to get rid of it. The thing is you have one more color involved than the optimal. So you know that, I mean, the optimal is being the degree of every vertex. So you know that you have, so say everyone has degree K, you have K plus one colors involved. So it means that around every vertex, there's one color missing. So you can think of this coring in the interest. I mean, this is also one step, step where it's uh, helpful that the graph is regular. Uh, because then you can really assume, I mean, you, you know that for every vertex, there's exactly one missing color. So say, for example, vertex U, um, say the color three is missing. So now if on V, color three is also missing, then you're really happy because you just wanted to get rid of the, I mean, get rid of the color two on this edge. And now here, because color three appears neither around U nor around V, you can, you know, without touching anything else in the graph, you can do a complete, complete change with colors two and three. That's one component which is just this edge UV. You do the swap. So all you did was just seeing the color of that edge, which becomes color three. And you know, you kind of freed up color two. So if the two here was one instead, then you'd be, and this was an ugly edge, then you would have won because you decreased the number of ugly edges. I mean, there are much more, I mean, there's a wider set of uh, situations where you're happy to get rid of some color. But there's one special case where you're immediately happy. So okay, that's a simple case. I mean, that's not a very stimulating case. So what about if uh, missing colors are, dis uh, are distinct? So U is missing color three and V is missing, say, color four. Okay, what can we do now? So you, you really want to recolor this edge too. I mean, you want to get rid of the, of the two here. So if you come directly, I mean, the fact that three is not missing around this vertex means that there is an edge called three around. I mean, again, that, that's why it's helpful that the graph is regular. So there is an edge color three around. So say it goes there. Now you can look at the missing color on the on that other endpoint. So again, if it's the same missing color as the as its neighbor, then again you can change this to four, and then now three is missing on this on this vertex, and you can switch the um, 
color you the HGV to color three. And again, you're happy you you wanted to get rid of uh, color two here without you know creating too much of a mess around. And if you have this situation, then you're happy you can do it uh, directly. I mean, almost directly. First, it was in just one step. Now it's in two steps that you can slowly get rid of color two here, but you know controlling exactly how you're changing the colors of uh, edges around. So again, that's a simple situation. So what if it's a different color missing? So it could, again, it could be missing color five, but then maybe you know you can, I mean, then for sure you find uh, some other edge around that's color five, and then you can start again. So if this is missing uh, color four, then you're happy, because uh, I can put this to four, and then you know this to five, and then finally UV to two, two three. But one bad scenario, for example, is if uh, this vertex is missing color three, because then you know, well, you can swap color three and five here, but it's not going to change the game in some sense. Like you still, you still not freeing up anything um, for the HUV. Like you're not gaining any freedom. So what's for a good framework to think about this? So you have this missing colors. I mean, I'm not going to do this case analysis for every single um, color and stuff. But what you can do is just define some auxiliary graph. So you fix some vertex, you look at the edges around that vertex. So here it would be really vertex V that we're looking the edges around of. And what you're thinking about is when you have an edge in C to V, in a way, how could you recolor it without impacting too much the rest? The natural coordinate is the color that's missing at the other endpoint. And then you know the only reason for not recording this is if you have some other edge around V, which is called precisely that. And then you can define, so this way, this auxiliary graph where you just, um, it's a direct graph. So you say you have an edge, and the only thing which is getting in the way of recording it is some other edge uh, in sin to V. So for example, in this case, uh, you really have the edge UV when you want to recur three, to recur it three, and the only thing going in the way um, is the edge VW. So you have an arrow from UV to VW, and then again, the only thing being in the way of recording a VW, I mean, to color five, is the edge VX. So you put an edge there. And then the only thing being in the way of VX is VW itself. And then, you know, you, know, you build the whole um, constraint graph, at least this connected component of it um, around the vertex V. So you can see, because you only ever have outgoing degree one, you don't have, you know, very complicated structures going around. So what can happen? Um, if you look at the sequence of vertices you reach in this auxiliary graph starting from one edge. So as you saw previously in this example starting from UV, if what you get is a path, meaning eventually you have an edge such that there is no obstacle to it being recolored with the color missing at the other end point, then you can just, you know, step by step recall them and then propagate and then eventually recolor the color you want, the edge you wanted to get the read of the color of something. <laughs> Um, but anyway, if you have a path, um, you're super happy, things just work out. If you have a cycle, um, it's not so clear that, that you can do anything. So, example of a cycle here, if you're trying to recolor the edge VW, well, you can try and just swap three and five, but in a way, you're not freeing up anything. Like, intuitively, from the point of view of V, this is just the same as before. So, you didn't really change the colors around or anything. So it doesn't look like you can do much, at least if you don't look further in the graph. I mean, it seems quite natural to think, well, if I look at things going around W and around X, then I might be able to do something. But if you look in a purely local way, um, cycles are kind of bad news. Uh, you need to get some more information. And then this third, PNP, sorry, third scenario um, is what happens here for uh, the edge 2 I mean, the edge UV color 2 there's something called a comet. So it's really um, first a path, and then a cycle, I mean, directly cycle. So exactly like this comet on three vertices. So then you're actually somewhat happier, not quite, but essentially what you can do is play a bit with the missing color um, on the middle, and then look at the color which is missing twice. And then you can make sure just by doing, you know, one complete change in these two colors, so you don't control how much they're going to modify in the graph, but only using these specific two colors. So you're somewhat happier with it. Um, then you can 
clean up in a way, come out and then be able to get rid of the color to here. In some sense, like, so you have some impact globally in the graph. I mean, you don't quite control how much, but you know exactly which two colors. So that's, you're sort of happy about this in some sense. So cycles are really the ones you're usually unhappy with. That's usually bad news. Like you want to get some freedom on one edge, and you find a cycle and it's not, not quite clear what you can do. Actually, in um, the Gizdizing theorem, the, the way you can get your, you can make things work is you have you have delta plus two colors involved at least, because you know, if you have at most delta plus one, then oh, someone was writing something. Uh, I'm not the one doing this. So I'm not sure how the Zoom video was uh, designed, but someone is writing on my slides. That's okay. That adds colors, I guess, to the to the graph. <laughs> as long as the scruples don't, you know, hide the text, then it's fine. Oh, they they disappeared. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah. So when you're trying to prove this theorem, then you have at least the set plus two colors. Essentially, what you say is there's only one bad color. Anyway, for cycles, then you can do some trick as well comets. Meaning you can change lots of things in the graph, but you control which colors, and you can always avoid the one bad color that you really don't want to increase the presence of um, in the graph. So it's really very simple. So you have this, you know, final like tools. I mean, I call them final like ju just because of historical reasons, because that's, that's how they're called um, in using proof, I think, or at least in some versions of them. Um, so really like you're trying to get rid of some color. So here of color, of color two on this edge, and you look at this actual graph, you have paths or cycles or comets, and paths and comets are mostly good news. I mean, I'm lying a little bit for comets, but trust me, I'm not lying so much. Um, so, okay, so that's, you know, I'm only saying, I'm saying that for cycles, things don't work yet. So how do you conclude in that case? So now if you go back to the general picture, because I mean, that was really one just, I mean, it was really a tool, as it said. Um, so it's really, how do you get rid of a color on one edge? So if you go back to the global picture, we have this perfect matching that you really want to color, all with color one. And you know, you have these bad edges and ugly edges that you want to somehow um, get rid of, at least gradually minimize uh, the presence of. So what you can prove, it's actually not, not super hard, is that somewhere in your graph, you have something which is exactly like this. So you have an edge which belongs to the perfect matching, so it should be colored one, but it's not. And on the one side, you're missing the color one. So you know the only obstruction to making this edge be colored one is that on the other side, uh, there is an edge colored one. So that's, that's what you know. I mean, you know you have some vertex uh, which is missing color one such that uh, so one of its incident edges should be in the perfect matching, I mean, is in the perfect matching, should be color one, if not yet. The only possible obstacle is that has one incident edge being colored one. So we know we have this somewhere. We don't control where, but we have this. So now, if you can just get rid of this edge colored one, you're happy. I mean, get rid of it without, you know, breaking anything around. That, that's why it's important to control how much you're changing. Uh, the coring when you do this series of campy, campy changes. Um, what you can argue, trying to get rid of this colored one, I mean, if you try to get rid of it locally around that XW, what you can argue is that this is a cycle. Because if it's anything else, if it's a path or a comet, then she can get rid of color one here without creating any new edge colored one, which is in some sense the only thing we care about in this setting. We don't mind, you know, changing the things color two and three and such as, as long as there is no edge which and no good edge, which was colored one, which now is not anymore, or conversely, an edge which should not be colored one and now is. So you can argue that it's neither a path nor a, nor a comet. So you know that when you look at things around W, saying from this edge uh, colored one, you know that things are a cycle. So you know, just as before, we don't quite know how to get freedom. But then the nice thing is actually you can argue that when you look at the other direction, so you look you still at the same edge, colored one, but now look at things around B. Then you can argue that this also has to be a cycle. I mean, so you wouldn't, you can't argue this directly. You first have to see what happens around W. But now knowing that the things around W are cycles, then you can for sure argue that only the other direction as well has to be a cycle. Otherwise, you know, you can decrease the number of edges. You'd be happy. Um, 
So now that I've both cycled, and you, know, you can remember I told you that when it's a cycle and you have no more information, you can't do anything. So you don't, you don't know how to compute. But now you don't have just one cycle, you have two cycles and they share an edge. I mean, they, they share the same uh, yeah, edge in some sense. And that means you're happy. That means that the fact that you have those two cycles, it means you can somehow break them and then put them back together, make sure you undo any evil you did in the rest of the graph and be happy. Unless, really, unless it's uh, one very specific scenario, uh, you somehow have some triangle VWX uh, here where X is missing color one. So X could be you. Uh, X could be you. You don't control who it is. Like it could be you, it could not be you. It's just some vertex forming a triangle with um, V and W and which is missing color one. So that's, that's the only place really where um, the chunk of assumption appears in our proof because the rest is very, very general, actually extremely elementary. I mean, all the arguments we use are essentially just saying, well, you know, you fool this part and then, you know, make sure you, um, you swap these things and then, you know, even if you swap lots of things far away in the graph, once you've done your little um, thing on the side, then you can walk back and like undo any, any bad things you, you did uh, in the rest. But the only thing which goes wrong is really if you have uh, a triangle here with a uh, third vertex missing one. Actually, we have a lot more information as to what the structure, I mean, not, not, just, not just structure, but also what the coring looks like when you have this and you cannot quite get rid of it. So that's why I kept saying, you know, we've been hacking at it, trying to improve it. And we're very, very confident that we can get more than this. I mean, at least, you know, for sure, we can, we can replace triangle free with, well, not triangles cross, uh, cross to each other and things like this. And we're hoping, you know, we can get should, we can make it diamond free or something like this, but um, it's very much work in progress. Um, yeah, I was really hoping I'd have a stronger claim to make tonight, but I don't. Um, so the conclusion, you know, so I was telling you there's this really, I mean, there are these two really, really nice in nature which are really natural, like I'm surprised they're not better known. Um, you know, this is how Wiesing's proof is, proof is theorem, which is cited a lot, used a lot, mentioned a lot, lots of people know a proof of it. And that's the supernatural question of, well, if, if your graph needs fewer colors, then can you actually reach that? Or, or are there obstacles to the proof? So as I said, we've proved it for triangle free graphs and we hope to, to prove more but one natural subclass, which is studied a lot in the context of edge coring, is that of planar graphs. So for planar graphs, I mean, you could try and do exactly the proof outline I tried to, uh, to pitch, but the, the small issue is that, you know, this thing I said about assuming the graph is regular, which you can assume for free, well, you know, the argument works, but it's not quite planar anymore. Um, so it's not such a big deal because in a way it's just like a comfortable uh, assumption to make, but it's kind of messy otherwise to pretend it's regular even though it's not and you know keeping track of what's going on uh, around the graph but I'm very confident that um, this should work for all planar graphs I mean no assumption on triangles or diamonds or k2 anything uh, yeah I believe this is reachable but of course what I really want is just you know no assumption whatsoever um, you know maybe at the start saying if you don't have any well, and some triangles or diamonds, any, any two adjacent vertices having a lot of common neighbors. That would be a really nice first step, even if we can't do all the graphs yet. Actually, I lied to you a little bit when I say this was visiting signature. Um, because his kind of was in the context of not just all graphs, but she all multigraphs, you know? Why, why uh, not be fully ambitious and try to allow, so you can't allow loops because how, how do you define a proper edge coring when you have loops? But you can allow multiple edges between the same two endpoints. And his kind of that you can always reach um, a delta plus mu. So mu being the multiplicity, mean max number of edges you can have between the same two endpoints in the graph. So it's known that you can always color with um, uh, max degree plus multiplicity. And the connection would be that you can always reach uh, an optimal edge coring is something for multigraph. So again, you can always still assume everything is regular and everything works. 
But the issue now with multigraphs is the um, auction error graph is not super well defined. Uh, I mean, it is well defined, but it, you don't quite have um, the same properties as you had before. I mean, just because the fact you have many edges with some endpoints, it's kind of like a nightmare version of triangles. You know, we're this struggling getting of the trend assumption, and now they would be a um, um, yeah, nightmarish version of it. So we kept joking with my co-authors, but I don't think I, I read the name. I mean, they were on the site, but I didn't read them out. Let, let me do it now. So it was, it is with uh, Oscar de Fran, Teresa Klimoshova, uh, Aurélie Lagout, and uh, Jonathan Arboni. And we kept joking, the five of us, that uh, the key ingredient to the proof is we keep using the fact that a path has at most two endpoints. That's, that's, you know, the fact we keep, keep using. And, you know, sometimes we argue on the board being like, oh, why would that be true? And the answer is often because the path has at most two endpoints. And for multigraphs, I mean, so the fact that the path has the most two endpoints is helpful when you can assume in a way all vertices are distinct. So when you have Heiger, well, Schoenger free in particular, um, you're happy because you can assume that everything around it uh, are distinct. So when you have the same, mi mi the same color missing three times, then you know, you know, one is not in the same can take components as the other two. So in, in a way, you can know for sure you can recall something without impacting the rest. And when you have multigraphs, well, you know, the same vertex could be could appear uh, x multiplicity times. So then you know it's much harder to use this nice deep theorem that uh, every path has at most two endpoints. Um, on this note, let me thank you. Um, thank you. Maybe we can all unmute ourselves and clap for Mart. Okay, and now there's time for some questions. Um, I think you could simply unmute yourself if you have any or write them in the chat and I can read them. Well, if no one else is going to go for it, I have a question. Um, Matt, it seems to me that all the way through, you've kind of been implying that Vising's conjecture is true, and it's simply a matter of removing conditions one at a time till you get there. Have you entertained the possibility it might be false, and that no. you might really, be, you should really be looking for a counterexample? <laughs> no, I, I completely get your point. Um, the thing is. Yeah, I think some part of me deep down really believes this conjecture is true. Um, it, it was not the case all, always. Like uh, actually, initially when I started working on, on this with uh, my four co-authors, um, we were more trying to think about, for example, G. And as soon as we had, I mean, you know, when we read the proofs for maximum degree three and four, we were really thinking, you know, there's no way we can prove any more possibilities just because it gets so much more complicated each time. It's really super, super technical. So how can we hope getting anything more uh, like this? So we are trying to build up examples. And then, you know, in some sense, through trying to build up examples, we got a better understanding of what was going on. And then we had this um, framework of, you know, this, well, kind of flame, but still uh, good, bad, and ugly edges, you know, trying to improve the uh, edge coring step by step. And now it really feels that I mean, I'm not explaining the fact that there could be an example, an example, but I think it would have a very weird structure. And I think actually, you know, when I insist on the fact that I want to improve the restrictions, in some sense that that's hinting at having a better sense of what the example would look like. Um, I'm quite confident that you could replace triangle with uh, essentially you know, two adjacent vertices with uh, max degree minus two common neighbors. So you would have like a component of the graph, which is almost um, separate from the rest. Like you have these two vertices, which have exactly the same neighborhood. And, and then I think once you, once you have this in lots of places, then intuitively you try and get like other 
tools to to sort of like a, other more direct tools to to prove the conjecture. Um, and it's possible there that you realize that there is some small contained example. I mean, some very well structured contained example. But um, I guess my point of view so far is that what we have is really far from what we can have. That, that's that's my strong conviction. So that's in a way that's sometimes why I keep pushing on the positive side, just because um, even if the whole thing is not true. Uh, a lot more is true than what we currently know. That, that's my belief. Um, but yeah, that, that's for sure a question we ask ourselves. So, uh, couldn't there be some weird contact examples? It's always hard to tell, always hard to be sure uh, what could happen, especially in this area of campy, campy changes. It's sometimes hard to see what's going to happen. there any other question? Uh, can I go with a question? Yeah. Uh, so this is Boyan. Uh, do you know for some special classes that this Wiesing's conjecture is true, let's say for complete graphs? Um, so, you know, actually complete graphs, we started, well, sort of started our project um spending one whole day on uh why is this true for complete graphs and <laughs> we still don't quite have a proof to be honest um i can't remember if i read somewhere that it's true for complete graphs i mean for sure it's true for some very classes let's say like if the max university didn't use a forest and stuff like that um yeah i just can't remember for complete graphs i yeah, I don't want to say anything uh, too false. But yeah, I remember I remember we spent a lot of time on this and we couldn't have a simple proof. So definitely a very good question. I, I, forgot, I forgot what was the conclusion, sorry. Yeah, so for uh, the edge colorings behave a little bit nicer than usual colorings, because if you take all colorings with more than chromatic number of colors, it could happen with usual graphs that uh, you not all of them will be camp equivalent. That's only uh, for this. But weird, with uh, a smaller number, it could be. So it's uh, but with edge colorings, this is no no not true. So it's uh, they behave much nicer with this respect. Yeah. So for vertex coloring, there's only one graph which uh, misbehave, right? I mean, one connected graph which misbehaves. That's well, the, uh, with with right? delta, yeah, but you can have uh, you can have more colors than uh, oh, yes. much more than chromatic number, and not all of them will be camp equivalent with that many colors. Yes, but uh, so maybe yeah, colorings with a smaller good. number of colorings are all camp equivalent. Yeah. Yes, but in some sense, that's related to the fact that for uh, edge coloring, you have a much better listening of the bound, right? right and yeah. for it behaves well as long as you're close to the upper bound. It's only when you're far away from it and close to the lower bound that things misbehave. And so you, you don't have a chance for this in edge coloring. But yeah, you're right. It, things, the behavior is quite different. Anyway, thank you for the nice talk. Yeah. Thanks for coming and thanks for asking this nice conjecture. Yeah, thanks, Mart. Um, maybe we can stop the recording now. <laughs>